Hello, my good friends. A very good evening. This is Live Irish Myths. I'm Anthony Murphy. For the next hour to hour and a half, we are going to delve into Irish mythology, Celtic myth and legend, just for you. You're very welcome to this 216th live stream. And step on into the library, make yourselves feel comfortable. Grab that blanket. Hope you have your slippers on. Cup of tea, tobacco pipe, if that's your thing. Dram of whiskey, whatever you fancy yourself. You're all very welcome. The camera needs some slight adjustment. Apologies for that. Uh, we are celebrating, well, yesterday, actually, the third anniversary of the beginning of this series, which started with a somewhat hesitant, well, there's Coda. Hi, you saying hello? Come here. Come on. Can you see? Ah, oh, look. Hi, Coda. Oh yes. Yes. How good of you to join us. Now, I, you can stay if you if you if you be quiet. We can do that. You be quiet. Will you not bark? Huh? Say hello to Amadeus. Not sure if he's there. Yes, indeed, Amadeus is there. So there you go. Yes, the whole thing began with that very cautious and somewhat reserved uh, broadcast on Thursday, the 12th of March, 2020, which was the evening upon which the Irish government announced restrictions, uh, immediate lockdowns. And uh, it was a very uncertain time. But I think that uh, what followed over the, the uh, weeks and months after that was the gathering together of a wonderful community from around the world. I have to say a special, I did earlier on on the Mythical Ireland community, a very special happy birthday to uh, three of our Tua who have been celebrating birthdays in the past few days. I have to single out in particular, Caitlin Moon. Caitlin is one of our regular viewers. Caitlin's birthday is the 12th of March. So her birthday coincides with the birthday of Live Irish Mits. Happy birthday to you, Caitlin. Uh, Jenna McGagan is celebrating today. Happy birthday to you, Jenna. And on Saturday, Federica Guy celebrated her birthday. So we have three wonderful ladies of the Tua celebrating birthdays in the past weekend. Three March hairs like myself. And uh, I uh, wish you, and I'm sure that the uh, Tua will join in in saying happy birthday to you all. To our comments, Elaine Dent Lingenfelter is the first in the house, but she was there an hour ago because you see the US viewers have sprung forward, whereas we in Europe do not spring forward until the last weekend of March. So uh, there's two weeks of the year where that five hour gap from Ireland to the uh, east coast of the States uh, becomes a four hour gap and the eight hour gap between Ireland and Seattle or San Francisco becomes a seven hour gap. But only for two weeks, we will spring forward on the last Saturday of the month, actually uh, in the early hours of the following Sunday, which is the 25th, the night of the 25th to the 26th and then things will normalize again only 15 celsius in texas today elaine not your usual boast you must have shared a few degrees around with some of the rest of us uh starting to feel a bit springish in the boyne valley after last week's cold snap uh, we didn't get much snow at the end of it all some people in ireland did but we didn't here in the boyne valley spike willow says it's been blowing a hooli all day here <laughs> i love that blowing a hooli well, I hope it has calmed down for you. Irish technical thinker, who's Marcus Dia to a more. Uh, good evening, Marcus. You're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. Joe Butler is in Colorado. Auntie Joe. Yes, our time changed. And of course, I forgot the Irish didn't change, but here we are. Yes, indeed. A few people caught out, but that's fine. You were early rather than late. Better to turn up an hour early than an hour late. Uh, Helen is saying greetings to us. Uh, and uh, thank you for your email, Helen. And uh, I will get round to reading that shortly. Guido Bruce says, hello, all. It's been a while for me. Did I miss much? Well, of course you did. You missed many uh, episode, informative episodes and a lot of very corny dad jokes. It's very good to see you uh, and happy uh, or a very good evening to you. Banakti and happy third anniversary to the Mythical Ireland Tua and Anthony from Virginia. That's from Mariana Dunn. Good, good afternoon, Mariana. And thank you very much, uh, not just for your, your wishes, but for being here for all of that time. John Main is in San Francisco waiting for the next storm. Oh, 
I think you may come back to Bell Mullet, John. <laughs> Wayne Bird says, everyone, uh, hello to everyone. Hope all's well. It's a lovely nine Celsius in Birmingham. That's nine degrees Celsius, not nine T, nine zero Celsius, because that would be far too hot. Wayne, it's great to see you. Marsh it down. So many shows now. So much knowledge you've passed on. Actually. Much appreciated. Sorry that the time changed threw anyone off. Yes, as am I. But look, it's not like the Americans and the Europeans always do things at the same time. You know, we just do things differently. I told you before, you guys call it an elevator. We call it a lift. I guess we were just raised differently. <laughs> I apologize. And yes, some of that knowledge, uh, in fairness, is just reading from books, which is what I'm going to be doing tonight. But happy to share it and happy that we can, as a community, uh, delve into the deep, misty past of Ireland. Robin Moonshadow is saying spring is on the way. Yes, indeed. Hope that those of you who are in Ireland were looking at Jupiter and Venus in the West. Beautiful starry evening here in the Boyne Valley. And by the end of the month, when we spring forward, it won't be getting dark till around half past nine in the evening. I will have the blind up and hopefully there'll be bright light and sunshine coming in uh, as we head towards summer. Miriam Magao, is it Magao? Magao says, hello from France. Belle soirée à tout. Uh, bonsoir, mon ami. You are very welcome, Miriam. It's great to see you. Michael Pike says, there you are. Yes, indeed. I hope that the confusion of the time changes didn't upset too many people. Johnny Wilson is in Dallas, in Texas. Well, Johnny, I know it's reasonably mild where you are. Uh, 15 Celsius, apparently. Gordon A. Viral is in the house. Gordon also recently celebrated a birthday. Happy birthday, belated to you, Gordon. Great to see you. And Scott Doherty. Uh, is saying hello from a rainy, rainy, rainy Southern Oregon. Well, there you go. Pacific Northwest climate, just like Ireland. Uh, and Gordon, I did, did I not see you in the background of a video about David Newton, the artist on YouTube recently. It's good to see you. Nick S. Casterton, another incredible achievement. Hi all, hope you're all keeping well. Spring's on its way, folks. Not long now. Well, we'll keep the fingers crossed for that because winter has been reminding us that it's still lurking around. Mick O'Sullivan is saying evening, everyone. Good evening, Mick. Great to see you. Rex Fortenberry is in a nice and cool 13 Celsius, Louisiana. I would think I would take 13 Celsius. We had a high of 10 today. Alan Hoskins is in a blustery Ballina, somewhere on the Tipperary Clare border. Hope all keeping well. Good to see you, Alan. Thank you. I think it was you that uh, reported a uh, dodgy comment today. That member was banned for breaking the rules. Desiree says, hello to all the two from Muddy, Colorado. Me and Amadeus are happy to be tuning in with everyone. Come here. Come here and say hello to Amadeus. Come here, buddy. Look. Oh, what? <laughs> ah, look. Say hello. Look. Say hello. Yeah. Wave. Hang on. Wave. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, you like that don't you yeah so he'll probably stay there now he, he he likes when i rub him he moves around so that he, he's getting a particular spot you know when you're itchy and you get somebody else to scratch your back he does that and, and like he'll stay there for ages as if to say yeah i'm really liking that and the ears go back and the eyes look sort of you know you, you know when you're just going oh yeah that's really lovely yeah yeah come here now you can stay no problem at all but but do me a favor just 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 don't bark really loudly because it's all right when you're out there and the door is closed but like i won't be able to hear a thing anyway uh coda says hello uh to all the two uh, and to uh desiree and amadeus happy three-year anniversary many happy returns to all amadeus is happy to see his buddy there you go um valerie says so good to be there here for the anniversary what a time i know three years wow where did that time go and, you know, it, it did take a long time to emerge from the pandemic and for things to return to anything resembling normality. It's good to be back to pretty much normal. But they were testing times as well, you know. But we, I think we, we did all right to distract ourselves from all that. That's a big rough, Anthony, says Fergal. <laughs> yeah. SPCM say, says, hello, everyone, from the beautiful Knocknashee Hill in Ireland's northwest. Brilliant. And uh, a place that I have yet to get pictures of. So I must make that a priority on my list. Tom King on Gawa, our uh, Tua, Forge, uh, Tua Forge, Forge Master, uh, our, our Smith, 
our great Smith is in the house. Hope all are good fettle. A raised drama, good health to all my friends in this anniversary. Oh boy, what a journey it has been. It has been a rather special one for you in particular, Tom, hasn't it? Uh, I didn't know you when I began this uh, three years ago. And uh, it's been it's been an interesting uh, friendship. Spike Willow is uh, saying birthday greetings or blessings to all the people who have birthdays, as is Helen. Um, I wish they would leave me clocks alone, says John. <laughs> yes, indeed. Who else have we got? Tom Lawler uh, is saying hello to the other Tom. Tom, uh, very good evening to you. Lexi Erickson, who also recently celebrated a birthday. Happy belated birthday to you, Lexi. Hope you're in good form. Great to see you. Good afternoon to all our friends in Denver and, of course, the state of Colorado. Julianne Osborne is saying a complete downpour here in the PNW. Our neighbor is building an ark and gathering animals. If his name is Noah, then I would start to get quite worried, actually. Uh, tell him. Not to bring a male and a female rabbit, because <laughs> he'll bring two on board. And in a few days' time, there'll be several hundred. Mark Gordon is saying good day. And I think, Mark, if you're in the usual spot, you are in Iowa. Very, a very good afternoon to all our Iowan friends. Jason says happy anniversary to everyone and happy St. Patrick's Day early. Just had a birthday. Ah, St. Patrick. Yes, 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 yes. I believe I have some, I, I had a very substantial article that I wrote last year about the mythology of St. Patrick. I have more information about St. Patrick that I think will make a live stream uh, next week, uh, this week, uh, sometime. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Valerie Gallagher says, we're waiting for the spring snowstorm in Rhode Island. And a year ago, I was landing in Ireland. Wow. Talk about anniversaries, huh? Michael Pike, two months to go and counting. Brilliant stuff. Patricia Pack is in the house. It's time for live Irish mirths. <laughs> yes, I do have a joke lined up. Uh, Tim Harper is laughing. <laughs> probably laughing at me, but he's definitely not laughing at my jokes. Erica Humberducey is saying hello from Ipswich in the UK. A very good night to you, Erica. Hope it is a nice one. Kathy May Dayo is saying thank goodness for daylight saving time because my lunch was late. Crazy weekend. My son came down with COVID and I feel like I might be getting it. Oh, hope all are well in this rainy Pacific Northwest day. Well, I hope that uh, if if that is the case, that it's not a bad dose. Uh, and just to remind us that although things may be coming back to normal, it is still out there uh, and hopefully you'll be OK. Anya Ryan is in the house. Good evening, Anya. Welcome. Yes, you did, says Gordon. Ah, yes, yeah, the eagle eye. I saw Richard Moore there as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayhem, I hope that's Mr. Mayhem by name only, <laughs> is in Door County in Wisconsin. A very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Ali, uh, I don't know, how do I say that? Gisel, Gisel, is in Tucson in Arizona. Good afternoon, Ali. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Lexi Erickson is saying Coda is a good boy. Oh, hang on. He may need to go. Do you need to go out? He's standing at the back. Wait one moment. He may have to relieve himself. He needs to go out. Oh, you do indeed. Okay. Yes, he did need to go out. And in fact, uh, in a few moments, he will probably want to come back in. So I'll have to let him back in, which is okay. Uh, Tom Lawler is in the Devil's Bit in County Tipperary. And of course, the legend of the Devil's Bit is that the Devil bit a chunk out of the mountains and spat it out into the plain where it formed what we now know as the Rock of Cashel. Is the yeah, the Devil's Bit is how far? It's north of uh, Cashel, if I'm correct, Tom, isn't it? Or is it northwest uh, by a distance of several miles? Maybe you'll fill us in. Uh, Robert Moray is in the wild north. Sorry. I will read what he says. I won't. Uh, um, I won't foreshadow it. The wild North Canadian Picts salute the people of Ireland and send courage to all the Gale patriots in your country in these times of upheaval. Yeah, most of the upheaval. Yes, let's not go there. But like, it's just yeah. We try to sort of maintain an even keel here on live Irish myths we try not to get dragged down by the stuff that's happening you know not that we ignore it we just try to rise above it uh, Adina Sparks is in the house happy three years to us all happy uh, thank you Anthony and Adina as I've said on numerous occasions you were definitely one of the people who was there on the first episode time flies when you're having fun says Elaine 
Couldn't say it better. You gave us a new normal, which was magical, uh, says Michael. I think I've got something in my eye. Thank you, Michael. That's, I uh, know, in fairness, it, it, it's been lovely. It's been lovely. Mavanway Melward is in the house. Good eve all. Nice to be back. Hope everyone's keeping well. Keeping good. We're going to be reading uh, a fair amount of uh, material, uh, some of it which will involve Welsh pronunciations. You may, please, if I may ask, and be so bold as to ask you to help me with the pronunciations. So happy Anthony brought you and the rest of the tour into my life. <laughs> uh, it's been good. It has been good. It has been very enjoyable. We've had some ups and downs. We've had some, you know, we lost Kelly Edmiston along the way. Uh, that was very, very sad because Kelly at that time was one of the few tour that I'd actually met in person. We later thankfully had the opportunity to meet lots of you at the Hill of Tara last year. Um, but I remember that was very sad. Um, and we had to boot a few people out along the way for making nasty and racist and derogatory comments. But like that's online for you. Hannah Peters is saying hello from California. I had a birthday on the second. Well, I am saying happy birthday to all the March hairs in the group. And a belated happy birthday to you, Hannah. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon to you. I can't join. Working. Ah, says Janet. Oh, no. Well, hopefully you'll catch up later. But we're saying hello officially. Janet Moran. Welcome to Live Irish Mits, even if you can't stay. Bernard Brian Mulholland says hello. Bernard Brian, it is great to see you. Hello to you. Thank you for the anniversary wishes. Hope you're having a great day. Paul Campbell is saying a nice way to mark the third anniversary. Greetings from Galway City on the Atlantic West Coast of Ireland. Good evening to you, uh, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Can't believe it's been three years, uh, says Mavanway. Either can I. I mean, it's really flying, you know. But then... As Elaine says, time flies when you're having fun. Amadeus ran to the door when you asked Coda if he needed to go out because he needs to go out. <laughs> well, I, one thing I'm not going to be able to do during this live stream is to run over there and open your door for you. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll get the chance someday to meet the famous Amadeus. Arche Archaeostronomy database is in the house. Got sidetracked. That's perfectly okay. I hope that was astronomic an astronomical sidetracking. I paused for a few moments. Uh, before we went live to look at Jupiter and Venus in the West. And they're at quite a distance now compared to uh, the recent uh, close uh, conjunction and are getting further apart. Jupiter will soon sink into the twilight, so it will leave Venus, the evening star, to shine brilliantly after sunset. Joseph uh, Ojeda, bonsoir. Trenonoa, Joseph. Thank you for joining us. Peter Kennedy is in Limerick this evening, not in Balbriggan. Peter, what a pleasure. Hope you are uh, in good fettle. Sue Prenter is in the house. Thank you, Anthony, for all wonderful chat information and support over these last months. Thank you, Sue. And uh, it's great to have you here. And as I always say, and I have said on numerous occasions, none of this would be mean anything if I was talking into an empty camera uh, and into an empty uh, online universe. Uh, it's the uh, family, the Tua, uh, the gathering that really makes it special. Uh, Don Hilton, I found you some giant Ravenstone earth mounds to check out on Rathlin Island. Have you seen the DNA link about the Irish not descended from the Celts by 2,000 years? I'll send you the Raven later. If you have any references to Ravens at Rathlin, please share. I'm not immediately offhand, uh, Don. Interesting subject. Look forward to seeing what you have. Marcus is saying, I was there for the first episode. You made our lives a little bit better, Anthony, over those dark days. It was a time when we could all just distract ourselves from everything that was going on. And I enjoyed that. And I enjoyed your company all the time. Chungus Khan is saying, happy anniversary. Thank you. It's my Ireland is saying, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening to you. And McCallum is in the house. Hope everyone's in fine form and enjoying better weather than what we've been having. Winter is definitely going out like a lion. Happy anniversary. Yeah, we've had a mixed bag, but we haven't had much snow, thankfully. Um, touching what does I say that? Adrian O'Beglin is in the house. Happy birthday to the group. Hello, Anthony. O. Adrian also had a birthday recently. Yet another March hair. So good to see all these uh, uh, babies of the spring equinox period uh, having their birthdays. Uh, Kristen Gray Taggart is saying, Gia Yivakarja, happy third anniversary from Northern California. Good afternoon to you, Kristen. Thank you for your wishes. And yes, uh, three years and counting. Who knows where it'll end up going? Maybe I'll get my own TV series. I'm sure I'll have to bring you all on. You know, we'll have to have an audience. 
that I, that is me caught up with the comments. So just a, a oh, Dennis Dwyer is in Tala. Good evening to our, all our friends in Dublin, in Balia Clea, and in particular to our friends in uh, Tala Muncher Parthalone. Um, so tonight we are returning all the way to the beginning. I joined at the beginning of May 2020 whilst in the grips of COVID. Mitflix helped get me through that difficult time for sure. Brilliant stuff. I can't believe it's three years. I really can't actually have forgotten except for Caitlin Moon reminded me when I wished her a happy birthday. We're returning all the way back to the beginning. In episode one and two, I believe, I read a couple of chapters of this work, which is Charles Squire. This is a reprint called Mythology of the Celtic People. The original was published in 1912 under the title Celtic Myth and Legend. Poetry and Romance, published by the Gresham Publishing Company in London. Now, Squire's work was one of the first in 1999 when I began my explorations of Irish mythology with Richard Moore, my good friend, the artist. Uh, that and the ancient Irish tales, right, Cross and Slover, if I can prize it out from between the other books. These were the books that gave me my first introduction. Now, it has to be said that Squire is not... That's not Squire, that's Squire. Squire is not without his flaws and very much sees things from the perspective of uh, an Ireland that was still, at the time, uh, considered by some, not, not by the indigenous Irish, but was considered by uh, many of the scholars to be part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. And so he writes about... Uh, well, I'm going to read the first chapter, which is called The Mythology of the British Islands. And he talks about the religion of the ancient Britons. Um, but really what we're talking about here is Celtic mythology. And of course, as William Wilde uh, pointed out in some of his writing, uh, the majority of what you read in terms of Celtic mythology, something we've said on numerous live streams in the past, the majority of what you read in any book about Celtic mythology is Irish. Uh, some of it is Welsh and some of it is Scottish, but a great deal of it is Irish. I am proud to say that as an Irishman, uh, but um, uh, not in a nationalistic way. I'm just happy that we have managed to retain so much of our ancient lore. Uh, Marcus suggests that I am the goat. Now, uh, um, I don't have a habit of climbing mountains, eating grass, uh, just in case you get any mistaken ideas. Um, northwest, as far as I know, says Tom. Yes, that's the devil's bit, northwest of uh, the Rock of Cashel. Just catching up on any comments that I might have missed. Um, so it has flaws. It's still, and I know that some people slate it, it's not that bad, actually, because you have to remember, when I started reading uh, Squire and Cross and Slover in 1999, I did not uh, at that time, uh, nor would I for a considerable length of time, have access to the sources, the prime primary sources, which are the translations and the original Irish text of many of the stories. Um, and now that I've done that, I can say that largely Squire was quite um, faithful. A lot of people criticize um, Lady Gregory uh, as well, as if her work is uh, an entire fantasy. And I find that a lot of her work is actually quite faithful uh, to the stories as they were retained. There are embellishments, of course, and there are some changes and of course one of the things about uh irish myth um and I, i'm going to talk about a few books before i get reading uh, and this is why this is um convenient to talk about it now uh quite a lot of the scholars who are translating uh, irish myth at the beginning and even before the celtic revival so wild william wilde who was the keeper of antiquities at the royal irish academy uh, and wrote several books and it was a, a, a Protestant Irish, as it were, man who took a real interest in the indigenous people of the country and had a respect for them, didn't look down on them in the way that a lot of the Victorian era scholars did, um, you know, and, and, and they wouldn't give any credit to the ancient Irish for being able to create monuments. So they ascribed a lot of the uh, ancient monuments that we talk about, the passage tombs, etc., to the Danes because they couldn't believe that the primitive Irish could have built them which is, in a, in a way, a form of that white supremacist uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, stuff that, thankfully, 
um, I think we've largely uh, dispensed with. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that actually the Irish and the British, uh, if you go back in time, uh, had so much in common. We had shared a uh, shared monumental landscapes. I have no doubt that some of the people who built the late Neolithic landscape, for instance, at Brunabonia, were people who had also uh, been involved in uh, late Neolithic constructions in perhaps Orkney and in perhaps places like um, Durrington Walls, uh, Stonehenge, that area. Um, so, yes, so despite the criticisms and where there are flaws, I will try to point them out, but by and large, it's faithful. Uh, it is a very good place uh, from which to begin an exploration of Irish and Celtic mythology, actually. But bear in mind that you cannot be without, for instance, if I was to recommend, say, five books or a handful of books, um, yet Squire and uh, Ancient Irish Tales would be good places to start um, because you can get cheap reprints of them without spending a fortune. But you would also need to have, for instance, MacKillop's Oxford Dictionary of Celtic Mythology, which is brilliant. Um, Dahi O'Hogan's uh, Encyclopedia of Irish uh, Mythology. Um, uh, Lady Gregory would be great. Um, some of Whitley Stokes's work, some of George Petrie's work, some of, pardon me, um, John O'Donovan's work. Um, you know, as much as you can get your hands on. But just always bear in mind, when you are reading a work that was penned by uh, someone who was, let's say, not Indigenous, uh, a scholar of British descent living in Ireland, that if you detect a disdain uh, for the monuments and the mythology, remember that that is possibly rooted in a sort of racism. Um, but thankfully, over time, um, became a thing of the past. Now, I am going to show you several books that I've acquired or books that just happen to be interesting uh, at the moment. This is one I acquired in August of 2021, but I hadn't read and I have begun reading. And it is The Fall of the House of Wilde. Now, uh, if, if you, you recognize the, the image on the cover, that's because that's Oscar Wilde, uh, the famous uh, writer, and poet and playwright. Um, Oscar Wilde was a son of the aforementioned Sir William Wilde, uh, William Wilde, I've been learning, was quite an erudite scholar. In fact, he wasn't just a polymath, he was a savant. Um, at a time when uh, the, uh, the political situation in Ireland was high, highly charged, but before there had been any sort of real development of modern government and fair and equitable government uh, outside of uh, Dublin, for instance, uh, when people were still uh, poor, hungry, and couldn't read or write. Um, but he's an interesting, uh, very interesting character, and I'm learning quite a lot about him. But he's actually the one that's credited with beginning the Celtic revival. So we hear names like Hyde, Douglas Hyde, and we hear names uh, like Yeats and George Russell, etc., etc. Uh, but in fact, the credit for beginning it all goes all the way back to Sir William Wilde. Now, the, the fall of the House of Wilde uh, relates to the fact that when William died, uh, he, he, he was in severe debt, and that debt was handed on to his family, uh, Lady Jane Wilde, who herself uh, published a book uh, of Irish uh, myth, folklore, and superstition and customs, which I have ordered a copy of, uh, and it's on its way, because it's one that I haven't got in my library, and I'm very interested. I spotted something in there that's a real gem for my uh, uh, St. Patrick uh, stuff that hopefully will come later in the week, if not this day, uh, next week. Um, and then, of course, they moved uh, Lady Wilde and Oscar. I'm not sure if the other son moved with them. They moved to London and then were enveloped by another scandal uh, altogether. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that one through. That's a real fascinating uh, 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 look at the Wilds. And I'm learning that Sir William Wilde did a lot of travel in the Mediterranean and in Africa, and that was very formative. He was only in his 20s at the time, but already at that stage, he was writing a lot, publishing papers, giving papers. He was a surgeon, uh, and uh, some of the earliest, the first maternity hospital in the quote-unquote British Isles 
uh, was in Dublin, the Rotunda, and he uh, he was involved, I believe, in founding the Eye and Ear Hospital in Dublin. A very, very, very interesting man. I will come back to the wilds, I promise you, but just give me an opportunity to, to, uh, to read more of it. Really fascinating stuff. Just going to pause for a moment just to make sure I haven't missed anybody coming in. Uh, can you repeat the dictionaries uh, authors? Uh, Gordon says, yeah, the Oxford Dictionary of, uh, I'll show you actually, the, the Oxford Dictionary of Celtic Mythology is by James McKillop, available in hardback and in paperback and uh, absolutely uh, thoroughly invaluable. Uh, really don't try to delve into Irish mythology and the likes of Squire without having this as a reference because uh, he gives you all the sources uh, the other one is um dahi ohogon uh dahi ohogon's uh, myth it's, i think his all was also called something like myth legend and romance um unfortunately it's very behind the radio here uh, remind me later i'll dig it out and if not i will i'll do you a favor i'll send you that uh, private message ohogon is deceased now unfortunately he was a great scholar too um poddy shut says happy anniversary would you be able to list the books and authors you'd recommend i tried writing the names down but soon fell behind any more monographs on the way yeah i've started a third monograph haven't had time i'm still writing the segish companion which is at ninety-eight thousand words believe it or not um the next monograph i did begin work on but i had to park it i'm also working full time i really wish there were uh, 40 hours in the day and nine days in the week and maybe i could get more done but yes there will be more on the way um so we had the ones that i was recommending were uh squire as a reasonably good introduction to the subject very readable and easy to pick up uh, a reprint and a secondhand copy for a few a few quid and um, the other one was ancient irish tales by uh, tom p cross and clark harris slover Cross and Slover, uh, which again, I believe, is an early 20th century work uh, for which you should be, yeah, 1936, for which you should be able to get reprints. Um, I really should, I know, I, I, I really need to do it. I keep talking about it, but I actually should really put together a short bibliography uh, of recommended work that would serve as a good introduction. Uh, Lady Gregory's... Uh, uh, work is available as a compendium called Irish Mythology. Now that consists of two major major books that she published: Gods and Fighting Men, the story of the Tuatha de Danann and of the Fianna of Ireland, arranged and put into English by Lady Gregory, and the other one being Cuchulain of Morhevna, uh, all about Cuchulain and the time. Uh, the larger one there being Gods and Fighting Men. That I have found. Uh, at least a dozen copies of in secondhand bookshops for a euro or two euros. I've gifted most of them to friends. Very easy to pick that one up uh, as a good sort of beginning or opening to the whole subject. You should be able to pick up, for instance, um, uh, copies of uh, Thomas Rolleston's work, uh, The Myths and Legends of the Celts, originally published as, uh, yes, Myths and Legends of the Celts, uh, but in what year I can't immediately tell you. I actually have two versions of that immediately to hand. I'll just double check. Yes. So they are these are two different reprints of the same book. Again, secondhand bookshops, ABE books, Amazon should be able to pick up copies of that fairly easily. Um, as a good cheap, um, cheap and cheerful introduction to the subject. Um, yeah. Uh, the work of P.W. Joyce, Ancient Celtic Romances, is another one that is uh, reprinted uh, at, a, at a reasonable price. Um, yeah, there are probably tons more that I'm not immediately thinking of. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, yeah. You could get yourself a copy of the town especially thomas kinsella's translation of the town again uh, i've spotted dozens of secondhand copies of that over the years uh, some of them 50 cent a euro 150 you know Sh uh, shumas mcmanus barb jordan is suggesting yeah uh, shumas mcmanus's book is called what uh, it's another of those it's like the cross and slover one it, it, um, it's not ancient irish tales it's something very similar Hang on, let me just move the radio. Sure, we might as well do it while we're here. 
move the radio out of the way. Do -do -do -do. So that's the O'Hogan one. Now, that's a, a later reprint. The earlier one is sort of a bigger format. But that's the Dahi O'Hogan one, The Lore of Ireland, an Encyclopedia of Myth, Legend, and Romance. Uh, invaluable. Um, yeah, the, the Shumas McManus one is called The Story of the Irish Race. And we, we did read from that uh, on at least one episode, if not several. Again, um, that was originally published, I think, again, that's early 1900s. And should be available in a, uh, a, a, a a later reprint. Yeah, 1921, 1945, 1966. This one published in 1990. Um, but there are loads more. I mentioned ancient Celtic romances from P.W. Joyce, uh, Patrick Weston Joyce. He, he wrote, he's the one who wrote Irish place names in three volumes. The originals of those are expensive. I treated myself to uh, the three. Uh, this was first published in 1894. This is a 1997 facsimile reprint. Uh, ancient Celtic romances. Um, oh, there's so much more. I mean, uh, uh, Macona, Prunchus Macona's Irish mythology. Um, uh, uh, O'Rahilly, uh, almost indispensable is uh, T.F. O'Rahilly's early Irish uh, history and mythology. That will cost you a few more quid. It's available from the Royal Irish Academy website, uh, published by the School of Celtic Studies, uh, the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, first published 1946, this reprint 2010. You'll pay more for that. that I, I don't know how much I paid for that. It might have been 30 or 40 quid. Uh, another... Uh, very very valuable piece of work um just the, the likes of J jacob's uh celtic fairy tales uh which again is one of those reprints that you should be able to get second hand and relatively cheaply uh oh there's so much do you know what uh, let me try to maybe just keep that in mind because we have to do some reading um Maybe it would be valuable to do a, an episode on the sources. Let's just literally give me a chance to put together a list and talk about each one uh, and give you a brief overview. But there is literally, I mean, I mean, there's even work that I didn't know ex existed until I found it in a, in a bookshop. Like, for instance, Celtic Mythology by Ward Rutherford, a book that I hadn't seen before. You know, um, there is tons and tons of work, I suppose. The most important thing from my point of view is the sources, you know, that a, a, a work has only a certain academic usefulness if it doesn't, you know, it's very important to get the sources, which is why I think the likes of MacKillop and O'Hogan are very important, um, which is why I have invested in so many uh, of the facsimile reprints of, for instance, the Metrical Dinchenicus the annals, uh, several of the books, the Zeitschrift and uh, Revue Celtique, where the philologists had their translations, um, you know, to have as much of it to hand as possible. Anyway, if you're beginning, you could do worse than to start with Charles Squire. Um, but we will definitely do. It sounds like there's... Um... <laughs> yes, I've completely run out of shelf space, Desiree. They're... Uh... They're, they're stacking up in piles on the floor. It's not good, you know. Well, it is good. It's a very good complaint, actually. Um, yes, several people saying they would be interested in an episode on the sources. So let's plan that uh, in the not-too-distant future uh, where we talk about uh, the sources and then we separate the good from the really good from the excellent. The, the, there, are, there aren't that many what we would call bad sources, but you just have to sometimes be aware. I don't like any book that talks about Irish monuments or mythology that doesn't have a bibliography and footnotes. If it doesn't have those two things, don't bother with it. That's what I say. However, some of those earlier scholarly works don't have such thing because they weren't, perhaps, uh, some of them do and some of them don't. Doesn't mean you always uh, rule them out. I would probably be interested in getting reading. Uh, last week, as some people asked me about Stephen King, I told you this was on order and it arrived today 
uh, Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption, a novella published in 1982 from which the film, the movie, uh, was derived. And I've been reading it um, on page 67, actually, so uh, more than halfway uh, through it, uh, reading reading that this evening after work. Uh, and I can say that the film is actually reasonably faithful to the uh, to the book. And the other one that I ordered was one we mentioned last week, and I just don't know why, but I picked it up because it was in a secondhand bookshop and it was 150. I bought it. I literally bought it. <laughs> I bought it. And I picked it up and I started reading it and I'm on page 95. I, uh, I, I tried to read it when I was in school a long time ago now. And uh, I don't know whether it was just too heavy or too much because it's so huge. But I actually found it hard to put down. Uh, really enjoying that. But I... I don't read much fiction. That's because I like to spend my reading time reading nonfiction, which informs my work. Um, so, for instance, another arrival today was a book that I became aware of a few years ago. I had seen it footnoted or in the bibliography of another book. And I thought this would be fascinating. Looked around for secondhand copies at the time. The secondhand copies were extremely expensive, 50, 60, 70, 80 euros. And I found recently... Uh, 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 I, um, a, a press that was republishing old work uh, in a print-on-demand uh, fashion. And so I found a copy of a book that is called The Rhizome and the Flower, The F Perennial Philosophy, Yeats and Jung. Now, Olney, in his introduction to the book, tells us that this isn't actually an effort... Uh, or, it may have been born out of the idea of comparing the works of W.B. Yeats, the Irish poet, and C.G. Young, the Swiss psychoanalyst. Uh, but uh, the two of them apparently may never have met. He, he, he speculates that they might have met uh, in a bookshop in Dublin. Um, and he says that Yeats had Young's home address. And Jung had a copy of one of Yeats's books, but Jung's son told Olney that he never read uh, Yeats's book, uh, that he had never, uh, he claimed in a letter to have never read the work of Yeats. And yet there is so much in common between them. So I've begun reading that. And it's fascinating. Um, but that's going to take time, I think, to get through. And the other one that I, I acquired a while back, and I'm not sure if I mentioned before, uh, was one that I was enjoying thoroughly, which is called The Living Torch, and it's all about George William Russell, A.E., edited by Monk Gibbon. In fact, I'm pretty sure I did mention it before, and I'm almost halfway through that, uh, A.E. being one of those figures associated with the Celtic revival, uh, a, a remarkable uh, poet and writer, and, of course, a mystic, uh, who had some very, very interesting... Uh, uh, writings uh, in particular one that we've read and one that was a feature of a video that was very popular on the mythical Ireland youtube channel uh, the dream of angus Og, in which he appeared in 1897 he appeared to describe the winter solstice illumination of the chamber of newgrange something that couldn't have been seen back in that time uh Irish technical thinker says it is my favorite book. It, it does. It certainly, it definitely does uh, drag you in. Uh, yeah. Somebody said it, it drags you in quickly or something like that. I can't see uh, the comment now. Um, but anyway, it is almost quarter to nine. I better get reading. Speaking of books, I was arrested last week. I was caught stealing an, ens an entire uh, set of encyclopedias. But I said to the police, wait, I can explain everything. <laughs> I laugh at my own jokes because I know out there I can see. I can't see you, but I can imagine people just going, oh, he didn't know. Oh, God. Look and go, no, don't laugh at your own jokes, Anthony. I have to have the comfort of a laugh. I have to know that the joke is funny for at least one person, you know. I'll be too tired to help you with the Welsh. <laughs> in other words, get a move on. Yes, indeed. Uh, we are beginning 
uh, Charles Squire's book, and the first chapter is called The Mythology of the British Islands. The Interest and Importance of Celtic Mythology. It should hardly be necessary to remind the reader of what profound interest and value to every nation are its earliest legendary and poetical records. Mavanway is pretending it, pretending it didn't happen. Or while well, Michael Pike admits to liking my dad jokes. <laughs> Gary Kyo has just arrived. And uh, thank you. Yes, it was a day on the sod. It was it was not a fine day on the old sod, Gary. It's what you usually say. <laughs> the beautiful myths of Greece form a sufficing example. In threefold manner, they have influenced the destiny of the people that created them and of the country of which they were imagined. They, they were the imagined theatre. First, in the ages in which they were still fresh, belief and pride in them were powerful enough to bring scattered tribes into confederation. Secondly, they gave the inspiration to sculptor and poet of an art and literature unsurpassed, if not equaled, by any other age or race. Wilde says something interesting in that regard. William Wilde said that uh, the Irish... Uh, pantheon sorry the irish corpus of mythological material was only surpassed by that of greece lastly when the quote glor the glory that was greece unquote had faded and her people had by dint of successive invasions perhaps even ceased to have any right to call themselves Hellene Hel hellenes they have passed over into the literatures of the modern world and so given to Greece herself a poetic interest that still makes a petty kingdom of greater account in the eyes of its compeers than many others far superior, superior to it in extent and uh, resources. Thus, what's the story with Nora? Esther Windsor. Oh, the old ones are the best. Yes, indeed. Uh, Nora, is that Nora Gaffney O'Connor? Did, did is she here? Did she make an appearance? Did she may say some? I can't see her comment. Nora, if you're there, hello. <clears throat> um, this permeating influence of the Greek poetical mythology, apparent in all civilized countries, has acted especially upon our own. From almost the very dawn of English literature, the Greek stories of gods and heroes have formed a large part of the stock in trade of English poets. So you'll see here that there is a, a, a certain English bias, but we'll have plenty and plenty and plenty of Irish mythology to talk about. Hello, Nora. Good evening. Were you out for a swim? Sandra Boothroyd is in the house as well. We have just started, believe it or not. We've had a long run up today talking about uh, books and sources, but we're going to do a proper episode on that soon. The inhabitants of, of Olympus occupy, under their better known Latin names, almost as great a space in English poetry as they did in that of the countries to which they were native. For, from Chaucer downwards, they have captivated the imagination alike of the poets and their hearers. The magic cauldron of classic myth fed like the Celtic grail, all to came to it for sustenance. And of course, the Dogda's cauldron being an example uh, uh, of something similar at last however its potency became somewhat exhausted alien and exotic to english soil it degenerated slowly into a convention in the shallow hands of the po poet tasters of the 18th century its figures became mere puppets with every wood a grove and every rustic maid a nymph one could only expect to find venus armed with patch and powder puff Mars shouldering a musket and Apollo inspiring the versifier's own trivial strains. The affectation killed and fortunately killed a mode of expression which had become obsolete. Smothered by just ridicule and abandoned to the commonplace vocabulary of the inferior hack writer, classic myths became a subject which only the greatest poets could afford to handle. But mythology is of such vital need to literature that, deprived of the store of legend native to Southern Europe, imaginative writers looked for a fresh impulse. They turned their eyes to the north. Inspiration was sought not from Olympus, but from Asgard. Moreover, it was believed that the fount of medieval, sorry, primeval poetry issuing from Scandinavian and Teutonic myth was truly our own and that, that we were rightful heirs of it by reason of the Anglo-Saxon in our blood. Again, you can see the 
Anglo-Saxon bias in this work. And so indeed we are, but it is not our sole heritage. There must also run much Celtic, that is, truly British blood in our veins. And Matthew Arnold was probably right in asserting that, while we owe to the Anglo-Saxon the more practical qualities that have built up the British Empire, we have inherited from the Celtic side that poetic vision which has made Engl English literature the most brilliant since the Greek. We have the right, therefore, to enter upon a new spiritual possession, and a splendid one it is. The Celtic mythology has little of the heavy crudeness that repels one in Teutonic and Scandinavian story. It is as beautiful and graceful as the Greek, and unlike the Greek, which is the reflection of a clime and soil which few of us will ever see, it is our own. Divinities should surely seem the inevitable outgrowth of the land they move in. How strange Apollo would appear naked among icebergs or fur-clad Thor striding under groves of palms. But the Celtic gods and heroes are the natural inhabitants of a British landscape, not seeming foreign and out of place in a scene where there is no vine or olive, but shading in with our homely oak and bracken, gorse and heath. So really, you know, quite a lot here when he mentions Britain and the British Isles, you know, in terms of the Celtic mythology, he's more referring to Ireland than he is to England, for instance, which is rather stripped bare, devoid of its original mythology, probably thanks to the Romans. Thus we gain an altogether fresh interest in the beautiful spots of our own islands. There's Coda, uh, who is still out the back, must let him in, especially those of the wilder and more mountainous west, where the older inhabitants of the land lingered longest. <clears throat> Saxon conquest obliterated much in Eastern Britain and changed more, but in the West of England, in Wales, in Scotland, and especially in legend haunted Ireland, the hills and dales still keep memories of the ancient gods of the ancient race. And there he sums up really the bias that when he says Britain, he's really talking about Western Britain and Ireland. I'm going to let Coda back in. Give me one moment. And he went straight into the kitchen, so maybe he doesn't want to hear about uh, uh, Squire's wanderings. Here and there in South Wales and the west of England are regions, once mysterious and still romantic, which the British Celts held to be the homes of gods or outposts of the other world. In Ireland, not only is there scarcely a place that is not connected in some way with the tr traditionary exploits of the Red Branch champions or of Finn and his mighty men, but the old deities are still remembered, dwarfed into fairies, but keeping the same attributes and the same names uh, of yore. So again, that's very important. Ireland was the place where uh, more stuff survived uh, than anywhere else in the British Isles. Somebody's saying, I feel a Monty Python quote coming along. <laughs> or I'll find, I don't worry, I'll find an excuse to throw in a Monty Python quote. Monty Python quote. Wordsworth's complaint that while Pelion and Ossa, Olympus and Parnassus are, quote, in Im immortal books enrolled, unquote, not one English mountain, quote, though round our sea girt shore they rise in crowds, unquote, had been, quote, by the celestial muses glorified, unquote doubtless seemed true to his own generation. Thanks to the scholars who have unveiled the ancient Celtic and British mythologies, it need not be so for ours. On Ludgate Hill, as well as on many less famous eminences, once stood the temple of the British Zeus. A mountain not far from Betisicaud was the British Olympus, uh, the court and palace of our ancient gods. Betisicaud, or Betis, was Betisicaud. We were there when I was a kid. Uh, on a family holiday in North Wales. And my, my dad, when we went to a restaurant for something to eat, asked the proprietor how you said the place name. And I believe he said Betasycoud. B-E-T-T-W-S-Y-C-O-E-D. Um, 
I hope that was a good pronunciation. It may well be doubted, however, whether Wordsworth's contemporaries would have, would have welcomed the mythology, which was their own by right of birth, as a substitute for that of Greece and Rome. And of course, that is the other bias, is that we've been so blinkered. I mean, we, uh, I mean, we, as in me and my peers, were educated in a Christian brother's school where <coughs> Greece and Rome were glorified. They had given us not only the religion of Catholicism, which a lot of the schools were founded upon, uh, but they had also given us this wonderful myth and legend, and we weren't taught any of our own stories. How incredible and remarkable is that? The inspiration of classic culture, which Wordsworth was one of the first to break with, was still powerful. How some of its professors would have held their sides and roared at the very notion of a British mythology. Yet all the time it had long been secretly leavening British ideas, sorry, English ideas and ideals, nonetheless potently because disguised under forms which could be readily appreciated. Popular fancy had re rehabilitated the old gods, long banned by the priest's spell, book and candle, under various disguises. They still lived on in legend as kings of ancient Britain, reigning in a fabulous past anterior to Julius Caesar. Such were King Lud, founder of London, King Lear, whose legend was immortalised by Shakespeare, King Brennius, who conquered Rome, as well as many others who will be found filling parts in old drama. They still lived on as long dead saints in the early churches of Ireland and Britain, whose wonderful attributes and adventures are, in many cases, only those of their original namesakes, the old gods told afresh. And they still lived on in another and a yet more potent way. Myths of Arthur and his cycle of gods passed into the hands of the Norman storytellers to reappear as romances of King Arthur and his knights of the table round. Uh, the guy who designed uh, the round table, by the way, was the knight known as Sir Comference. I didn't read that from Squire. Thus spread... <laughs> Uh, thus spread over I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, I apologise <laughs> thus spread over civilised Europe their influence was immense their primal poetic impulse is still resonant in our literature we need only instance Tennyson and Swinburne as minds that have come under its sway <laughs> Nicky Hansbury says oh no <laughs> but I did get a laugh from a few uh, no uh, that one, yes, <laughs> Nora is laughing. And Mavanway is smiling. I'm not sure if that's at the joke or the pronunciation of Betasy Cowd. This diverse influence of Celtic mythology upon English poetry and romance has been eloquently set forth by Mr. Elton in his Origins of English History. The religion of the British tribes, he writes, has exercised an important influence upon literature. The medieval romances and the legends which stood for history are full of the fair humanities and figures of its bright mythology. The elemental powers of earth and fire and the spirits which haunted the waves and streams appear again as kings in the Irish annals or as saints and hermits in Wales. The knights of the round table, Sir Kay and Tristram and the bold Sir Bedivere, it says here, uh, betray their mighty origin by the attributes they retained as heroes of romance. I will say one thing about Squire. Some of his spellings of the Irish deity names are interesting. We'll get to that in time. It was a goddess, Dea Quedam Fantastica, who bore the wounded Arthur to the peaceful valley. Quote, there was little sunlight on its woods and streams, and the night were dark and gloomy for want of the moon and stars, unquote. This is the country of Oberon and of Sir Juan of Bordeaux. It is the dreamy forest of Arden or Arden. In an older mythology, it was the realm of a king of shadows, the country of Gwyn ap Nudd, who rode as Sir Guyon, G-U-Y-O-N. Uh, is that Guyon? A, a, a variant spelling thereof uh, uh, in the fairy queen and this is a quote from same and knighthood took off sir huon's hand when the king oberon he came to fairyland 
to trace Welsh and Irish kings and saints and hermits back to, quote, the elemental powers of earth and fire and the spirits that haunted the woods and streams, unquote, of Celtic imagination, was to disclose primitive pagan deities under the medieval and Christian trappings of King Arthur's knights will necessarily fall within the scope of this volume. But meanwhile, the reader will probably be asking what evidence there is that the apocryphal British kings like Lear and Lud and questionable Irish saints like Bridget are really disguised Celtic divinities. Or uh, we did, of course, do uh, uh, an episode about just that subject in February at the time of Imbolc or uh, more specifically around the time of St. Bridget's Day. Uh, Bridget's Day and Imbolc, remember, I wrote a blog post at the time saying they're not the same thing. Or that the Mort d'Arthur, with its love of uh, Lancelot and the Queen and its quest of the Holy Grail, was ever anything more than an invention of the Norman Romance writers. He will demand to know what facts we really possess about this supposed Celtic mythology alleged to have furnished their prototypes and of what real antiquity and value are our authorities upon it. The answer to this question will be found in the next chapter. I think despite our late start, we should read the second chapter. I, I, I would hate to leave it there because we've only done about 15 minutes of reading after all the stuff that came before it. <laughs> it's a Robin who bravely rode away. There are Monty Python uh, references springing up in the comments, which is a great delight. Yes, indeed. Uh, the Holy Grail uh, being one of the... Uh, uh, famous Monty Python films uh, for which I have great fondness. Chapter two is called The Sources of Our Knowledge of the Celtic Mythology. Let me just check the page count here till I see exactly, or till I estimate how long it's going to take. Okay, right. Well, I'm, I'm reading quickly. I'm not slowing, so we should be fine if everybody stays away. Oh, people are urging me on. Yes, read, read. Keep going. Uh, is Alan Hoskins' uh, comment. Mickey Ansbury, keep reading, please. And uh, Nora Gaffin Connor, carry on, Sir Anthony, we beseech you. <laughs> then uh, that I will do. We may begin by asserting with confidence that Mr. Elton has touched upon a part only of the material on which we may draw to reconstruct the ancient British mythology. Luckily, we are not wholly dependent upon the difficult tasks of resolving the fabled deeds of apocryphal Irish and British kings who reigned earlier than St. Patrick or before Julius Caesar into their original form of Celtic myths, of sifting the attributes and miracles of doubtfully historical saints, or of separating the primitive pagan elements in the legends of Arthur and his knights from the embellishments added by the Romance writers. We have, in addition to these, which we may for the present put upon one side as secondary, sources, a mass of genuine early writings, which, though post-Christian in the form in which they now exist, nonetheless descend from the preceding pagan age. These are contained in vellum and parchment manuscripts long preserved from destruction in mansions and monasteries in Ireland, Scotland and Wales, and only during the last century brought to light, copied and translated by the patient labours of scholars who have grappled with the long obsolete dialects in which they were transcribed. Uh, and, and this is the great value of those uh, pre-mentioned pre uh, Victorian. Victorian era scholars, the likes of Whitley Stokes, for instance, his output was phenomenal. Another savant, not just a polymath, uh, for whom we are in, uh, greatly indebted. But we can now and have been through uh, Irish scholars in the past 50 years, been re-examining those, uh, some of them, and finding that in some cases the translations were a little bit lacking, uh, and especially where there was bias uh, in terms of this this notion that the ancient Irish couldn't do anything that was holy or sacred or cultural, uh, which turns out to have been just a complete uh, lie. Many of these volumes are curious miscellanies, usually the one book of a great house or monastic community. Uh, everything was copied into it that the scholar or the of the family or brotherhood thought to be best worth preserving. Hence, they contain matter of the most diverse kind. There are translations of portions of the Bible and of the classics and of such then popular books as Geoffrey of Monmouth's and Nennius's Histories of Britain, Lives of Famous Saints, together with works attributed to them, poems and romances of which under a thin disguise the old Gaelic and British gods are the heroes, together with treatises 
on all the subjects then studied, grammar, prosody, law, history, geography, chronology, and the genealogies of important chiefs. The majority of these documents were put together during a period which, roughly speaking, lasted from the beginning of the 12th century to the end of the 16th. That is the era in which most uh, uh, Irish manuscripts uh, containing mythological, uh, genealogical, uh, uh, metrical material uh, were um, composed, although there is earlier stuff that undoubtedly got destroyed during the wars with the Vikings. In Ireland, in Wales, and apparently also in Scotland, it was a time of literary revival after the turmoils of the previous epoch. In Ireland, the Norsemen, after long ravaging, had settled peacefully down, while in Wales, the Norman conquest had rendered the country for the first time comparatively quiet. The scattered remains of history, lay, lay and ecclesiastical, of science and of legend were gathered together. Of the Irish manuscripts, the earliest and, for our purposes, the most important on account of the great store of ancient Gaelic mythology, which, in spite of its dilapidated, dilapidated condition, it still contains, is in the possession of the Royal Irish Academy, where a lot of it, by the way, remains to this day, folks. I was intrigued to read in the Wild Book that the Royal Irish Academy was originally located in Grafton Street. Um, it's now in... I can't remember the street. I can see it. But I can't remember. It, it, it was originally in Grafton Street, that sh uh, street, that pedestrianised street in the heart of Dublin that is well known as being a shopping street these days. Unluckily, it is reduced to a fragment of 138 pages, but this remnant preserves a large number of romances relating to the old gods and heroes of Ireland. Among other things, it contains a complete account of the epical saga called the Toyn Bo Chulnge, the raiding of the cattle of Cooley, in which the hero, Cúchulán, performed his greatest feats. This manuscript is called the Book of the Dun Cow, or in Irish, Lauranahira, from the tradition that it was copied from an earlier book written upon the skin of a favourite animal, a calf, belonging to St. Ciaran, who lived in the 7th century and was said to have been the founder of uh, Clonmac Noise which is not mentioned. Okay, maybe it is. I'll not uh, preempt it. An entry upon one of its pages reveals the name of its scribe, one Mailwurry, uh, Mailwurry, Mailwurry uh, MacKellahor, which I believe would be the precursor to the modern Irish name Kelleher or MacKellahor, whom we know to have been killed by robbers in the church of Clonmacnoise in the year 1106. In other words, while we say Lauer and Ahira, um, is early 12th century. It may actually be 11, early, uh, late 11th century. Far more voluminous and but little less ancient is the Book of Leinster. Lauer nach Nuchonval, or uh, often anglicized to uh, the Book of Nohoval, said to have been compiled in the early part of the 12th century by Finn McGorman, Mac Gorman, Bishop of Kildare. This also contains an account of Cuchulain's mighty deeds, which supplements the older version in the Book of the Dun Cow. Of somewhat less importance from the point of view of the student of, Cal of Gaelic mythology came the Book of Bally Moat and the Yellow Book of Lecan, belonging to the end of the 14th century. And the books of Lecan and Lismore, of course, the Yellow Book of Lecan and the Book of Lecan, two different manuscripts. Uh, so the books of Lecan and Lismore both attributed to the 15th. Besides these six great collections, there survived many other manuscripts which also, also contain ancient mythical lore. In one of these, dating from the 15th century, is to be found the story of the Battle of Moitura, fought between, <coughs> between, excuse me, between the gods of Ireland and their enemies, the Fomors, or demons of the deep sea. And I did say in that very first episode, uh, just over three years ago, uh, on the 12th of March 2020, that Squire always uses the Fomors in place of what we would call the Fomorians in Irish Fovore. Let me just see if I'm missing any later arrivals. I don't think we've ever told Anthony to stop reading when he asked if he should go on. We are addicted to the readings. It's probably a good complaint. If you were saying stop, uh, yeah, I'd probably be wondering why. But it's good. It's all good. The Scottish manuscripts preserved in the uh, Advocates Library at Edinburgh date back in some cases as far as the 14th century, though the majority of them belong to the 15th and 16th. 
They corroborate the Irish documents, add to the Cúchulainn saga, and make a more special subject of the other heroic cycle, that which relates the not less wonderful deeds of Finn Ossian and the Fenians. He spells Oshin, O-S-S-I-A-N, which is, I think... Yeah, we had this discussion recently, didn't we? I, I wasn't aware of the or, or origin of that spelling of it. Uh, more c- commonly rendered O oh, father I S I father N here. They also contain stories of other characters who, more ancient than either Finn or Cuchulain, are the Tua de Danon, the god tribe of the ancient Gaels. The Welsh documents cover about the same period as the Irish and the Scottish. Four of these stand out from the rest as most important. The oldest is the Black Book of Carmarthen, which dates from the third quarter of the 12th century. The Book of Anurin, which was written late in the 13th. The Book of Taliesin, assigned to the 14th. And the Red Book of Hergest, compiled by various persons during that century and the one following it, that's 14th and 15th. Regina Riley is in the house. Long time no see. Good evening, Regina. Thanks for joining us. You're very, very welcome. The first three of these four ancient books of Wales are small in size and contain poems attributed to the great traditional bards of the 6th century, uh, Murdin, Taliesin and Anurin. The last, the Red Book of Hergest, is far larger. In it are to be found Welsh traditions of the British Chronicles, the oft-mentioned triads, verses celebrating famous traditionary persons or things, ancient poems attributed to Chlywarch uh, uh, Hen. I'm absolutely butchering that. Apologies for my Welsh pronunciations. And of priceless value to any study of our subject, the so-called Mabinogion, stories in which large portions of the old British mythology are worked up into romantic form. Apparently, I could do all the voices. I presume we're talking about the uh, the uh, or not dead, uh, the uh, Monty Python voices. The the whole bulk, therefore, of the native literature bearing upon the mythology of the British Islands may be attributed to a period which lasted from the beginning of the 12th century to the end of the 16th. But even the commencement of this era will no doubt seem far too late a day to allow authenticity to matter which ought to have vastly preceded it. The date, however, merely marks the final redaction of the contents of the manuscripts into the form in which they now exist, without bearing at all upon the time of their authorship. Avowedly, copies of ancient poems and tales from much older manuscripts, the present books no more fix the period of the original composition of their contents than the presence of a portion of the Canterbury Tales in a modern anthology of English poetry would assign Chaucer to the present year of grace. This may be proved both directly and inferentially. Now there's a, 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 sorry, a footnote here which I will read. Satisfactory summaries of the evidence for the dates of both the Gaelic and Welsh legendary material will be found in pamphlets number 8 and 11 of Mr. Nutt's Popular Studies in Mythology, Romance and Folklore. I don't have access to those. They may be accessible as PDFs somewhere on the internet, but it would be interesting to uh, to read that. It's talking about Alfred Nutt. In fact, I may have some of Alfred Nutt's work, but I'm not sure. In some instances, as in that of an elegy upon St. Columba in the Book of the Dun Cow, the dates of authorship are actually given. In others, we may depend upon evidence which, if not quite so absolute, is nearly as convincing. Even where the writer does not state that he is copying from older manuscripts, it is obvious that this must have been the case from the glosses in his version. The scribes of the earlier Gaelic manuscripts very often found in the documents from which they themselves were copying words so archaic as to be unintelligible to the readers of their own period. And this is where we get the study of what's called Old Irish, because we see words in Middle Irish or uh, compound words in Middle Irish uh, that uh, uh, don't make any sense. And we were able to derive uh, older versions of words which had become defunct by the time the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century AD had come around. Uh, 
To render them comprehensible, they were obliged to insert marginal notes which explain these obsolete words by references to other manuscripts more ancient still. And of course, those marginalia or glosses, as they are called, are so helpful to uh, not just the philologists, uh, but also the historians who are looking to try and track down the origins. Um, you know, a book uh, which appears to be 12th century uh, will often contain uh, glosses and marginalia which suggest that it's based upon an earlier work. Often the medieval copyists have ignorantly moved these notes from the margin into the text where they remain, like philological fossils to give evidence of previous forms of life, which is exactly what I just said, and I should not try to explain things so much and just read, because it's all there. The documents from which they were taken have perished, leaving the medieval copies as their sole record. In the Welsh Mabinogion, the same process is apparent. Peculiarities in the existing manuscripts show plainly enough that they must have been copied from some more archaic text. Besides this, they are, as they at present stand, obviously made up of earlier tales pieced together. Almost as clearly as the Gaelic manuscripts, the Welsh point us back to older and more primitive forms. The ancient legends of the Gael and the Briton are thus shown to have been no mere inventions of scholarly monks in the Middle Ages, something I've been saying and repeating ad nauseum since we began this series and for many years previously. We have now no trace, if possible, sorry, we, we have now to trace, if possible, the date, not necessarily of their first appearance on men's lips, but of their first redaction into writing in approximately the form in which we have them now. Circumstantial evidence can be adduced to prove that the most important portions, both of Gaelic and British early literature, can be safely relegated to a period of several centuries prior to their now existing record. Our earliest version of the episode of the Toynbo, Coolinga, which is the nucleus and centre of the ancient Gaelic heroic cycle, of which Cuchulain Fortissimus Heros Scotorum, uh, fort, fortissimus, strongest, forte is loud, fortissimus, heroes, scotorum, the loudest or the strongest or the greatest hero of the Irish, scotorum, remember I told you before, Scotland takes its name from an Irish tribe, once upon a time scotorum uh, was the Latin name for Ireland, is the principal figure is found in the 12th century book of the Duncow. But legend tells us that at the beginning of the 7th century, the saga had not only been composed, but had actually become so obsolete as to have been forgotten by the bards. Their leader, one Sankan Thorpisht, a historical character and chief bard of Ireland at that time, obtained permission from the saints to call Fergus, Cuchulain's contemporary and a chief actor in the raid, from the dead and received from the resurrected hero a true and full version. This tradition, dealing with a real personage, surely shows that the story of the Thoin was known before the time of Shenkhan, and probably preserves the fact either that his version of Cuchulain's famous deeds became the accepted one, or that he was the first to reduce it to writing. An equally suggestive consideration approximately fixes for us the earliest redaction of the Welsh mythological prose tales called the Mabinogion, or more correctly speaking, the four branches of the Mabinogi. In none of these is there the slightest mention or apparently the least knowledge of Arthur around whom and whose supposed contemporaries centres the mass of British legend as it was transmitted by the Welsh to the Normans. All very fascinating. I just see a lot of comments. So just give me a second. I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything important. Yes, Gordon Farrell, Scotty, the Scotty. Uh, they were the Dalriatha, weren't they? Who went from Ulster or what? Was that Ullad? Uh, no, that was Dal Dalriatha. What am I talking about? That was the kingdom of Dalriatha. They went across the water uh, into Scotland. Um, they were the Scot Scotties. Thank you, Snapper Earl uh, and, and Don Hilton. Um, let me just check. Lexi says, love the books of Wales. I'm working my way through them. I've read the Mab... Uh, uh, non-Welsh to understand it so whatever helps yeah I, I i'm the same i also possess in my library for instance something i haven't read but i am interested in just having and i will get round to it at some point the, the canterbury tales by chaucer um i 
believe I might have somewhere a copy of more Mort. Is it more or Mort Darthur? Uh, uh, and I'm not sure whether I. Yeah, I'm not sure where that is. But you know, I mean, for instance, one of the books that you'll see quite often mentioned, even in Irish works, is Beads. The Venerable Beads, Ecclesiastical History of the English People. Um, there's lots of comparative stuff in there um, and, and lots of mentions of, 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 of Ireland um, and other parts of Britain, I mean, outside of England, um, that might be relevant to our study of what we call Celtic mythology. Anyway, all very good. Uh, don't limit yourself. Uh, the most expansive knowledge is the best one. The more you know, the less you can misstate. That's the way I, I put it, you know. What was that last Welsh word, Anthony? I can't remember now, um, of any, um One that I thought I butchered. Um, can't remember now. Trying to find it. And I'm not sure if it was a word or a personal name or a place name several pages ago that I thought I had butchered that I can't immediately see now. No, I can't find it. I'm sorry. Um, that was a while back. Yes, indeed, butchered. Don't worry. <laughs> yes. Am I getting that one right? Mabinogian. How do we say that? I've never known. And Talisin, I know I said that before. I'm not sure about the pronunciations of those. I had to read. Uh, Becca02 says, I had to read the Canterbury Tales in high school. It was interesting. These mysterious mythological records must in all probability therefore antedate the Arthurian cycle of myth, which was already being put into form in the 6th century. On the other hand, the characters of the four branches are mentioned without comment, as though they were personages with whom no one could fail to be familiar in the supposed 6th century poems contained in those four ancient books of Wales, in which are found the first meager references to the British hero. Such considerations as these throw back with reasonable certainty the existence of the Irish and Welsh poems and prose tales in something like their present shape to a period antedating the seventh century. But this again means only that the myths, traditions and legends were current at that to us, were current at that to us early. I don't know. Sorry, I'll read that again, but I'm pretty sure I'm reading it right. But this, again, means only that the myths, traditions and legends were current at that to us early, but to them in their actual substance, late date in literary form. If I was an editor, I'd be saying, yeah, take a lot of the commas out there and shorten that sentence. A mythology, or reword it, a, a, a mythology must always be far older than the oldest verses and stories that celebrate it. Elaborate poems and sagas are not made in a day or a year. Wow. And here, Squires, uh, I find myself echoing Squires' sentiments, and I have been doing for years. The legends of the Gaelic and British gods and heroes could not have sprung like Athena from the head of Zeus, full-born out of some poet's brain. The bard who first put them into artistic shape was setting down the primitive traditions of his race. We may therefore venture to describe them not uh, as not of the 12th century or the 7th, but as of a prehistoric and immemorial antiquity. Agree wholeheartedly, Squire. We may not agree on, on some things, but Mabinogion, you just say it as you read it. Grant, okay, that, that sounds fairly straightforward, Mavanway, but there are uh, words with, I think what, that word I was trying to, or that name I was trying to read, started with L-L-Y. Um, the one that I think I'd butcher. Yes, 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 yes here it is. L L Y W A R C H H E Yokami N. Mm. I'll type that into the comments. L L Y W A R C H H. How do I get the mysterious H with the that accent on it? I don't know. But anyway, that's the one I butchered. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, Nog as in Bog, Mabinogium. Uh, and Yon as in the center of Yon, Mabinogion. That's very helpful. Would I remember that now? You know, for the next time, Mabinogion. Okay, not Mabinogion, Mabinogion. Okay. Jason says Welsh is the world is, world's hardest language. Uh, a lot of uh, European, like Spanish, Italian, even German speakers would say that English is the hardest language to learn. But I, I don't know because I, I'm not much of a linguist. Unfortunately, I'd love to be able to speak several languages. Internal evidence bears this out. That is the statement that uh, the mythological uh, traditions derived from uh, prehistoric and immemorial antiquity. An examination of both the Gaelic and British legendary romances shows under embellishing details added by later hands, an inner core of primeval thought, which brings them into line with the similar ideas of other races in the earliest stages of culture. I will say one thing, uh, and this is an important caveat uh, to what we're talking about right now. Remember that this work was published in uh, 1912 so we had several Irish scholars. I think the one best known for pushing back the origin of the stories was Miles Dillon, the likes of Nora Chadwick, the likes of Crunchus McConaughey. But we have a new generation of scholars here in Ireland who are saying, no, a lot of the Irish stories actually do derive uh, from uh, biblically, in, biblically inspired and classical inspired stories and that they're basically copies or inventions or imports or whatever. So just be careful with that. Make sure that you're... Uh, if you want to really study it in depth, uh, get all the opinions and then form your own from the evidence, you know. What I'm saying is what Squire is saying here about the prehistoric age of the myths uh, was agreed with, I think, to a large extent by a generation of scholars of the 60s and 1960s, 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s, okay? But that the more modern scholars now are sort of arguing with that uh, and, and it's kind of helpful to have all these points of view um i still think uh, uh, there is information in the myths of brunabonia describing aspects of those monuments that cannot have been known when they were written down and to me that's that tells me a lot tells me that those stories survived orally for many many long centuries Uh, I better read that again because I've lost my place. Internal evidence bears this out. An examination of both the Gaelic and British legendary romances shows under embellishing details added by later hands an inner core of primeval thought which brings them into line with the similar ideas of other races in the earliest stage of culture. Their local colour may be that of their last editor, but their plots are pre-medieval, pre-Christian, pre-historic. The characters of early Gaelic legend belong to the same stamp of imagination that created Olympian and Titan, Aesir and Jotun, or is it Jotun? I'm not sure, uh, in the Scandinavian myth, J-O-T-U-N. Is that pronounced as a J or as a Y? We must go far to the back of civilized thought to find parallels to such a story as that in which the British sun god, struck by a rival in love with a poison spear, is turned into an eagle from whose wound great pieces of carrion are continually falling. This aspect of the Celtic literary records was clearly seen and eloquently expressed by Matthew Arnold in his study of Celtic literature. He was referring to the Welsh side, but his image holds good equally for the Gaelic. And of course, Gaelic here meaning Irish. Quote, the first thing that strikes one, he says, uh, quote, unquote, he says, open quote again, in reading the, the Mabinogion is that is how evidently the medieval storyteller is pillaging an antiquity of which he does not fully possess the secret. He is like a peasant building his hut on the site of Halicarnassus or Ephesus. He builds, but what he builds is full of materials of which he knows not the history or knows by a glimmering tradition, merely stones not of this building, 
but of an older architecture, greater, cunninger, more majestical, unquote. His heroes, quote, are no medieval personages. They belong to an older pagan mythological world, unquote. I really love that. And that's exactly the same uh, for the, the Irish. The heroes are no medieval personages. They belong to an older pagan mythological world. So, too, with the figures, however humorized, of the gr three great Gaelic cycles, that of the two of the Danon, of the heroes of Ulster, of Finn and the Fianna. And of course, humorization is the process by which a deity is mortalized, become, becomes human. In other words, uh, quite a lot of that influenced by the church, the reduction of deity to mortal means that they're not a threat to the one and only true God of the Christian religion. Their divinity outshines their humanity through their masks may be seen the faces of the gods. Yet gods as they are, they had taken on the semblance of mortality by the time their histories were fixed in the form in which we have them now. Their earliest records, if those could be restored to us, would doubtless show them eternal and undying, changing their shapes at will, but not passing away. But the post-Christian copyists, whether Irish or Welsh, would not countenance this. Hence, we have the singular paradox of the deaths of immortals. There is hardly one of the figures of either the Gaelic or the British pantheon whose demise is not somewhere recorded. Usually they fell in the unceasing battles between the divinities of darkness and of light. Their deaths in earlier cycles of myth, however, do not preclude their appearance in later ones. Only indeed with the closing of the lips of the last mortal who preserved his tradition can the life of a god be truly said to end. Wow, what a quote upon which to end this episode. Only indeed with the closing of the lips of the last mortal who preserved his tradition can the life of a god be truly said to end? And that reminds me of a quote in um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Judith Nyland's book, the first one, um, A Legacy of Wisdom. Uh, and I don't know who it's attributed to that um, no tradition dies until the last person who honors it dies. And so we are fanning ancient flames back into life. We are preserving in our own way. What we're doing here is helping to resuscitate uh, those ancient stories uh, with the aim that they will not perish in our lifetime, in our generation. And hopefully the Renaissance, the revival that has been going on for the past century and a half or two centuries will continue and not just continue, but flourish and thrive and this material uh, which is so wonderful uh, and so romantic uh, and so potent uh, will uh, flourish uh, and propagate uh, uh, and be promulgated uh, to such an extent that pretty soon uh, uh, it, it will be revert to a few generations ago when everyone knew these stories you know uh thank you elaine for your kind comment very nice of you to say so nora gaffney connor the storytelling keeps the deity alive yes yes absolutely very true all i had was a bit of wine so i poured a bit of wine on the porch in a bowl for the the good folk and the damn cats are drinking it <laughs> yeah keep the wine for yourself a little drop of milk uh, yes <laughs> love this time machine says erica uh, I, what i like actually about what we've been doing with squire's work and i will continue uh, that work is out of copyright uh, as far as i know so we could probably read the whole thing if we want uh, what i really love about it is the is the inclusion uh, of the welsh and the scottish and the english that we're able to do this comparative work that we're not just looking at irish myth uh, in an insular way in an isolated way ch is like a hiss in the thro throat oh right 
Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I, I may. Uh, is Welsh on Duolingo? I, I might give it a go. You know. Yes, Adrian says, Mavanwe, you got half the viewers at home hissing like cats now, and some of the cats are drinking wine, which will make them hiss even more strangely. I've read the first branch, and the stories seem the same. Yeah. Uh, what I was fascinated by was Joseph Campbell said something, and I can't remember in which book it was, but I'll find it. I know it's there, it's in the library. But Joseph Campbell said once that if you look at the stories of the Fianna, I think he was talking about the Finn cycle in particular, the Oceanic, uh, the stories of Finn and Oshin and Oscar. If you look at the Finn cycle of stories that were written down in the Middle Ages and you compare them with the versions that were still being told uh, by the Irish peasantry of the late 19th and early 20th century, they were they were identical. The stories were the same which I think is fascinating, you know. I think it's fascinating, and yet at the same time, it doesn't surprise me at all, because my contention is the stories of, for instance, Dentianicus, Tonbo Kulnia, uh, the the stories of Tua de Danan, the Battle of Moitura, uh, the Fomorians, etc., that by the time they were written down, they were already very, very ancient, you know. Apparently, after the Norman Conquest, says Anne McCallum, I'm having a lozenge because my throat, I've been talking too loudly, 1066, there was a controversy as to whether the Norman French or the old Anglo-Saxon language should be prominent. So Chaucer and some of his contemporaries choosing to write in Anglo-Saxon helped to determine the form of the English language. In what century um, uh, French became the official language of Britain for a while in the 12th century, wasn't it? Um, but it was only the official language of government, as it were. And most of the common folk couldn't speak it at all. And eventually it was decided to revert back to English. But French, it's fascinating. French was for a time the official, as it were, the governmental language of Britain. Jason is pointing out a typical Welsh word. Are you messing now or is that genuine? Because I couldn't tell you. Um, but yes, that uh, longest village name, you know. Uh, that I won't even begin the LL land fair piddle with go go rock and all that stuff. Yes, it's on Duolingo. Yeah, I think that would help. If, even a few lessons just with the pronunciations. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, you're very welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, keep an eye out for some stuff about St. Patrick during the week. Agreed. This group has become a second family, says Desiree. And even the dogs, the pooches, and the cats, and the animals. Um, thank you, Joe, for that lovely comment. Uh, friendship is a huge part of it, absolutely. Donna, thank you indeed for the, the birthday wishes. Uh, Live Irish Myths continues more than three years after it began. Um, I'll send you the Raven Mound image, Anthony, one of the three. Please check old books re Rathlin Island. I do actually have a collection of books about islands. I'm interested in island lore because I visited several islands over the last five or ten years. And at the Irish offshore islands, that is. And I find them fascinating. I have lots of books about Irish islands and lore and, you know, so Rathlin is just one I'm not sure that I have um, a book about. But anyway, I will. Um, anyway, thanks for everybody for the wonderful uh, fun that we had. Um, we're back to Squire uh, next week. I'm just trying to figure out when, if I, if possible, that I may um, uh, talk a little bit more about St. Patrick in the live stream. You see, that episode that I did last St. Patrick's Day was based on, I think it was a 6,000 word uh, article or paper that I, paper is not a good word because it's not too academic, but a uh, 6,000 word article that I'd written uh, for patrons actually uh, the patrons saw it first and I have to add a little bit of material to that but that in itself would be, it'd be no point just repeating that because it would be just a repeat of an episode um, there's some interesting stuff about the snakes and, uh, that I think would make maybe the makings of, of, of at least a, a, a short episode Alan has been listening while walking Searsha the Greyhound. 
really enjoyed this evening. Brilliant stuff, Alan. And I, I hope you're having the sort of evening. Well, certainly before I started, the stars were out. It looked lovely out there. Congratulations on your third anniversary, says Gordon. Keep it going. We shall do our very best, uh, Gordon. Hopefully we'll be here in another three years. Somebody saying hello from India. Hello and a very, very good night to you from the Boyne Valley in Ireland. Tom King uh, enjoyed uh, the evening. Superstars, every one of you. So thankful for all the support. Until next time, stay safe out there. Boyne Valley sends many blessings. Yes, indeed. Tom's still working away at the forge. And I can just see that lovely flame aglow under the stars of the smooth road. Fantastic. There are some interesting crossovers with the myths. There are. Uh, and the Jungian point of view on that is that a lot of the images of mythology emerge from the collective unconscious, whereas the modern scholars would prefer to say, no, they nicked it from the Bible or they nicked that idea from the Homer's Iliad or they nicked this, that and the other. I think the truth is probably a little bit more grey, probably lying somewhere between, in between. We need to get that mythical island pets page going on. Yes, I know. Actually, Desiree, if you want to set that up, you can. I'm not sure if you know how to do that, but you have my permission to call it, you know, the Mythflix pets and pooches page or whatever you want to call it. If that would be quicker, because I know I keep saying it and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah and every day I'll like get distracted by other things. Mythical Ireland, yes, indeed. Uh, Bob Couch, thank you for joining us, Bob. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. We'll see you on the next one. Uh, fingers crossed. Bob watching on YouTube. Don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, do subscribe to the channel and give the video a, a like. It, it helps to spread the word. Thank you, Donna. You too. Uh, absolutely. And uh, Elaine is saying, keep the fire burning. Uh, the metaphorical fire. And of course, she's probably talking about the physical fire of Tom's Forge as well. With a photo of you hissing like a cat. <laughs> yes, indeed. Anyway, all that remains for me to do, apart from ask you, as I always do, to consider supporting Mythical Ireland by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland, is to bid you all a very good night from the Boyne Valley. Next Monday, we have that slightly reduced time difference with the States, but the following Monday, we will have sprung forward and we'll be back to the usual time difference. So just be aware of that. doesn't matter if you turn up an hour early. It looks better than turning up an hour late in my book. Folks, have a great evening. Take it easy. Ikhwa uh, Kulosov, uh, Slongafol, and, of course, most importantly, Tog Gopuge. Ikhwa Mokarjigalir.